For Kate Fort Stachard, I grand if a truck ought the Lurney Belladish and Potkale at Tier Tug of Oknus, the Desarian Clash and Hulskola Balia Ahle. You're very welcome to Folklore Fragments, the podcast from the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin. Now, for listeners who may be joining us for the first time, my name is Johnny Dillon and I'm an archivist here at the National Folklore Collection in UCD. And this platform, this podcast, has been developed as a way to explore the richness of Irish and broader European folk tradition. By dedicating each episode to a specific aspect of our cultural heritage and traditions in depth and drawing on our manuscript collections, sound archive material and various secondary sources. For many people, folk tradition is most often associated with old stories, with customs, beliefs, rituals and superstitions and so on. But folk tradition encompasses much more than that and it includes aspects of our material culture, trades, occupations, pastimes and sports. And I'm honoured today to be joined by one David Keown, who has quite literally been unearthing a lesser known aspect of Irish physical culture, namely the tradition of stone lifting, which, while well well attested in other parts of Europe and further afield, is a topic about which relatively little is known in Ireland. David is a multiple national European and world champion in kettlebell sport, is a world record holder, avid strength historian and stone lifting fanatic. So David, <laughs> Fadishdach. Johnny, thank you so much for having me. Legend. Oh, delighted. I'm so excited. Like, Same delighted. as, I'm thinking I'm going to burst. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we hope to do today is to give an overview of the stone lifting tradition in Ireland. So it's a tradition that um, some listeners, people might be totally unfamiliar with. It's a tradition that maybe other people listening might be aware of, but in slightly different contexts. Mm-hmm. So um, in terms of the tradition, which is maybe more active in Iceland and in Scotland in particular, that mm-hmm. was where I was introduced to it first. Yes. Same those here. beautiful documentaries, the Rogue Fitness documentaries. And it was, it was from seeing those documentaries, in particular the, the Scottish one, um, that Stoneland, that made me think... It, when one of the stones is named after the Fianna and the Fianniacht and the stories of Fionn and the Fianna and I was like this this has to there has to be this has to be part of a broader kind of uh, a tradition that's on these islands as well exactly and so at that point I kind of marked it down as one of many topics you know in, in my to-do list and which I've been interested whatever to search through our collections here to see maybe what we have what was collected in, in the folklore collection from people in the 20th century and earlier on this topic mm. but I have to thank you really for all that you've done because it wasn't until um, I found your profile on Instagram through a post that I made. Somebody had tagged you in it. And I saw, oh, shit, David is here. He's actually gone out and doing this and finding these stones. And, and I couldn't believe it. So from, from seeing you doing that and from the contact that we made initially then, I started to do a more active trawl through the archive to see what what do we have here? What sort of material is there? Mm. I was amazed to see that there's a huge abundance of stuff. We've barely begun to scratch the surface of this of this. Uh, tradition really. So hopefully today I'd like to give an overview of some of the collections, some of the material that we have to familiarise people with with um, what this tradition kind of, what, what the scope of it is, what it encompasses, some mm-hmm. of the different characteristics of it that we have determined so far, but then also to give a sense of, of uh, to look into what, what have you been doing and, and the work you've been doing, literally uh, driving around up and down the country finding these things and unearthing them and, and then lifting them for the first time in generations. It's been, so. it's been just an incredible journey, Johnny, you know. Um, like you said, I mean, my initial contact with this kind of lifting was from those rogue documentaries yeah, you know, over yeah, Scotland. Yeah. They're beautiful. And, they're beautiful. <clears throat> I mean, as a documentary alone, I'd recommend them to anybody, even if you're not into strength history. Or 100%. Yeah. Just as a documentary on viewing beautiful landscape and history and culture, they're, they're priceless, yeah. you know. So, like, I started off, like yourself, with those, and especially the one, the one in Scotland. I mean, that just blew my mind. You know, that there's stones over there that are not just you know, lifting stones, not just something to pick up. These have, like, cultural value. And they were, like, rites of passage from boys to men, you know. So a stone that was used 500 years ago in a certain glen in Scotland is still there. Mm. And that was used as, like, the man had to lift that or the boy had to lift that the chest to become a man, you know. And the fact that they're still there, like, it actually blew my mind. It was like, I have to go over and see these things. Mm. I have to. So... I watched the documentary and about 12 months later, I said to my friends, look, I'm going over to Scotland to lift these stones, you know? And I got in contact with, um, do you remember in, in the documentary it was Martin Janssens? Mm. Um, I got in contact with Martin, like that, like social media is fantastic that way. You just look up someone's name and you can automatically message them. And he was like, yeah, come over. Yeah, so over, over we went over to Scotland. And when was this, sorry? This was, I think it was two years ago now. Mm. Went over in a camper van with two of my friends and I met up with Jamie Gorion on the first day and Jamie took me around the whole of the Southern Highlands um, 12 stones we done in one day 
and every stone and every glen had its own lifting stone. So every glen and every clan had its own stone. You know, that's what I found fascinating. Like because you go into the next glen, they had their own lifting stone, their own rites of passage. You go into the next one, it's the same thing. Mm. They all weighed slightly different. So there's a great challenge to go over and do them, you know. And there's a great sense of accomplishment about going over and doing it. You know, if you felt great, you know what I mean? It's, it's this, like I said, these rites of passage that we don't have anymore. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're not here. And I think people crave that because we're so, kind of losing away a little bit with the likes of strength training and stuff in gyms. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I suppose there's, there, there's a sort of, uh, like the context in which we see these expressions of strength or endurance or, at, or like competitions locally between parishes, between townlands, whatever. It's all connected to the natural landscape. It's connected to the local townland or parish that someone's from. Um, and then, like you were saying as well, where there's generations upon generations of people who have taken part in this. Like, I always find the thing about material culture often is the aspect of folk tradition that shows you more about immaterial aspects of, of tradition in this, insofar as that you have an object that's been, say, used as part of a, of a, of a ritual or rite of passage for a long time. It imbues a sort of spirit in, into that it, there, there's oh God, a there's yeah. a gravitas and, and a weight to that item which is kind of lacking in in you know in a commercial gym and not yeah. to give out about commercial gyms or people training or whatever of course but there can be i suppose a certain over commercialization a sterility to that sort of environment and and what we're looking at here with these collections and this tradition is something totally different it's part of, it's bound up in the natural landscape it's bound up in people's day-to-day work it's bound up in a kind of local identity and then this idea of, of, of local heroes really so um but yeah, when I saw those those those, uh, those documentaries, I was just I was astounded, like, by the beauty of them and that sense of the the, the tradition and how far back that tradition goes. Yeah, as and well. being part of something, being part of the clan. You know, you become part of the clan when you live this. Yeah, well, and then like you were saying, we were saying this when we were kind of when you came in earlier on about the idea of like, say, for many young people in Ireland and for, further afield, you know, where there's so many aspects of, of tradition or traditional forms of identity are being eroded, kind of in in, in modernity, or whatever. Mm. If you're from a certain townland or a rural, provincial kind of midlands place, you might think like oh, I'm just from this. Like there's nothing going on in this t- in this town or whatever. Nothing to this place. But you don't know that what generations of strong men were doing in in your own locality, who the local heroes were. You might have been related to one of them. And suddenly, that stone in the field isn't just some stone in this local kip that you don't even care about. That you want to get out of. It's it's got this. It's so you got a whole history. It's got a dignity and a grandeur to it, and a, and a beauty. Yeah. To it. And there's something then you can you know transcend you yourself there in yeah. that and try and better yourself in, in that in that place in that moment or whatever. So so I had I had posted a thing about um a book, uh, Stone Mad, which is about stone cutters, the kind of stonemasons trade in Cork. It's a beautiful book which I suggest people read if they haven't. And that was where somebody had tagged your page on Instagram. And I posted it on the NFC Instagram, so yeah. tagged you tagged it. And I saw you were over on, on the Iron Islands. That's right. And that was that was the first stone that you found. That was the very first one. Can you tell us the story I about I certainly ab- can. I mean that was it was like something from a film, you know, I mean, like I said, I saw, I went to Scotland, lifted the stones over there, and then it was like, Iceland also has a huge culture of stone lifting, and we were there in the middle, and there's absolutely nothing here, so like, like, there has to be something here, we're so similar to the Scots, and like, we're very, very similar to the Icelandic people, you know, so it's like, why is our island bare, and there's such a massive tradition over there, you know, and I was talking to one of the lads over in Scotland, I was talking to, to Jamie, and he said, 10 years ago here, he said, 10 years ago, 2012, we only had two lifting stones in Scotland. Two. The Inverse Stone and the Dinny Stones. And that was it. Peter Martin would be then a Scottish, like uh, Indiana Jones type figure. He went off and researching and looking for and found another 30 stones. Just, again, researching through old books and libraries. And he found another 30. 30. Is he, is he the guy with the published thesis online, the beautiful yes, study? Yes, that's yeah, Peter that's Martin. Really you know, and he's really done really amazing work. You know, yeah. So, like I said... Ten years ago, there was only two. So that gave me great hope. I was yeah. like, surely there's something here. So I started researching. So I went online, as everybody was, went on to Google, and I typed in um, stone lifting in Ireland. And I got one of Peter Martin's chapters. A chapter, his 13th chapter in his book is called The Irish Lifting Stones. Now, all he has is the names of the stones. He doesn't have anything about them. He just has the names. He has Inish Moor Stone, Inish Man Stone, the Flag of Dane, and a couple of other stones like that. Mm. So it's like, okay, there's a stone in Inish Moor. So then I typed in Inish Moor stone and I got a story by a Mr. Limo Flaherty. I'm sure you know Limo Flaherty, mm-hmm. fantastic Irish writer and very known for his short stories. So I was reading 
through all his short story names, I wanted to see only a story called The Stone. So The Stone was about like a, a man, kind of, like an older man lamenting his loss, virility and, youth, and, and strength and youth, you know. But there's some beautiful references to a stone, an actual specific stone that was lifted over there. I, I'll read a bit if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. It said, it was a round block of granite. It sparkled as the sunshine shone on the particles of mica in its surface. It lay on the ground in a clear space between the rocks. All around it were bruised stones, bruised to a powder. And where it lay, there was a little hollow. That stone had lain in that place as long as the oldest traditions in the village could remember. And from time immemorial, it had been custom of the young men in the village to test their strength by lifting it. Mm. That's a beautiful little piece. So it's like, that's a beautiful little piece of, of, of writing. Is that real? Is it just fiction? Um, so again, more digging happened. And I found, on, again, on Reddit, Peter Martin was in a, a Reddit thread. And in the thread, there was a woman who lived on the island and said, Hi, my name is Fiona. There's a boulder on a rough pathway down towards Port Vale and Dune in Gorton Coppel. And the locals used to lift it. And that's the story that Limo Flaherty wrote about. So it's like, it's there. It's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, okay, now I have Limo Flaherty. I have Peter Martin saying it's there in his book. And I have Fiona, God bless her, whoever she is, mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago wrote that in a Reddit thread. And like, that all it took for me to go looking. So me and my friend Peter hopped in a camper van and we went over on probably the worst weather day in, in Irish history. <laughs> we went over to the Aran Islands. It was like Gale Force 6, the waves up and down. But we got to the island, we got on our bikes, it's a 25 minute cycle to get to this place. And we come to this rough, boulder strewn pathway in, in Gorton Cop. And we hop off the bikes and walk down. And we're like, yeah, I don't know if you've ever been to the Aran Islands, and anyone, like, if you haven't, go there because it's absolutely spectacular. But when you get there, it's like, there's just stones everywhere. It's just rock. Like the, the ground is just rock and there's just boulders, thousands. It's like, how am I meant to know which one is the one, you know? But I had this little piece and as I was about 50 yards away, walking down, looking left and right, I see this large rose pink granite boulder sitting in a little patch of grass, like it says in the, in the, the piece, by itself, bruised stones all around it. And it just called to me, I was like, that's it. That, there's no two ways about it that has to be it I didn't know for then like for certain that was it but like you know when you feel mm -hmm. you know you put your hands on it you're like, you can almost feel the energy of this it's like that's it so and it's huge I mean absolutely I mean no, no offence to anyone in Scotland but this stone is an absolute monster of a stone you know so I could barely break the ground I think I got it about like a, an envelope's width off the ground the very first time and I came back and Jamie Gorian, who was had a contact him, but I met in Scotland, he was like, I'm coming over straight away. I'm going to lift that. So four weeks later, we go back out and get the weather was, was totally different. And uh, beautiful, like, seems like last week. We, we cruise over, get on our bikes, get to, the, get to the place again. He gets a fantastic lift on it. I get a better lift on it this time myself. And as I'm walking back, there was a man um, giving a walking tour, like an old man, maybe in his, in his 70s, late 70s, giving a walking tour to some uh, American tourists. And I was like, excuse me, I said, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you know anything about the stone down there, the, the, the boulder, the lifting stone? Oh, I do. I said, shy. I said, the, the, the Moulin, he said. Uh, Moulin Port Vale on Dune. That's the name of the stone. And I said, is it the pink? Yeah, the pink one, he said. I was like, that's it. That's it. There it is, you know. That's the lifting stone. We weighed it. We brought over lifting, weighing gear. And we weighed it at 171 kilos, which is immense. You know, the, the largest Scottish mainland lifting stone is 160 kilos. This is already, like the very first Irish stone is a monster at 171, you know? And just to find it and to get the verification from mm. a man living on the island. And it was unfortunate because he said, look, oh, there, was, there was an old man living there. He, he was in his 90s. You know, he died six months ago. He knew everything about that stone. But he said, you know, no, definitely it's the pink one down there. It's definitely called the Moulin, Port Vale on the mm. And it's the one that Limo Flaherty wrote about, you know? Mm. So... That was the start. It was like, that's our very first one now in Ireland. Yeah. And since then, I mean, I've had people come from Australia to come over and lift it. And everyone's tagging me in their post now because you're the person who found it. A gentleman from Canada came over to lift it. And a couple of guys from Scotland have come over to lift it. Hmm. And I think just the story behind it is, is amazing. It is you incredible, know? yeah. You know, yeah. and the fact that it's, it's got that cultural toy to the Gleam of Flaherty who was born on the island. He, I think he lived in Gorton hmm. you know, and that stone was just down the road from, from him. You know hmm. what I mean? Just a couple hundred yards from where he lived. So there's an O'Flaherty festival on over there every year. So me, myself and, and Conor Heffernan have been invited over next year to give a talk down at the stone. Brilliant. We're going to read the story of the stone by the stone itself get a couple of strong and get a couple of lifts on it. Beautiful, yeah. And kind of make a little event of it. Savage. You know, going yeah. forward. Yeah. 
So that was the first one. That and then so that was when when I found your the the profile on Instagram. Then that was the, that was I think the only ones that had been found at that stage. Yeah. And then that set me off like right, just start digging now properly through the collection. Um, and then just as a bit of background as well as for anyone, we have two two manuscript collections here. One of them is the main manuscript collection, which is thousands of manuscripts that were compiled by full time and part time adult folklore collectors traveling around the countries interviewing people, and sending it back to HQ to the folklore commission. And then the other. Is a, is a manuscript collection called the Schools Collection. And that ran from 1937 to 1939. And the Irish Folklore Commission, together with the Department of Education, put folklore collecting on the school's curriculum for that year for senior pupils, for the equivalent of six class kids. So kids who were around 11 years old. And there was 55 different topics in a little booklet that was sent out. Uh, I'll read with them now. And one of those topics deals with, with the question of local heroes, basically. Local heroes, yeah. So there's about 5,000 schools, about a generation of about 50,000 children who uh, who would be in their mid-90s today. We've interviewed a few of them, but I well, mean, they're, you know, there's not many not that generation that, yeah, I can left. Imagine, yeah. So I just want to read out. So the, every every Friday, the teacher would go through um, a list with one topic with the students, and those pupils then would go to their parents and grandparents or people in the community, and they would ask them the questions laid down by the Folklore Commission in this booklet. So this is the, these are the questions on local heroes. It says, accounts of local men who in former times or even recently won fame in some field of activity. Strong men, name and address, accounts of their prowess at weight throwing or lifting stones, sacks of grain or potatoes, weights, etc. Uh, how they did these feats, their opponents, onlookers, scene of the contest. Was there a challenge? Great stone throwers. It then carries on, talks about runners, great walkers, great jumpers, powerful swimmers, great mowers. Noted dancers, singers, storytellers, versifiers was another one, right? Versifiers. Versifiers, yeah. <laughs> so to shoehorn that into a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so this is one of the topics that, that were, that these are one of the, some of the questions, the topics that the children had to ask. But since Isn't two, that fantastic? It is. The foresight to do was, was incredible. Yeah. And then since 2012, we've started digitizing those collections and putting them online to our, our online platform, duchas.ie, D-U-C-H-A-S dot I-E. And it was there that I started going through the material to try and find uh, items to send you, inspired by what, what you had started to do. And yeah. the first one that I think we came across was the, the uh, Lonergan stone, Thomas, Thomas Lonergan. Thomas Lonergan stone. In Shanahan. And so when I sent that to you, I think I sent it to you on like a Friday or Saturday or something, and then I was absolutely amazed to receive photographs back from me. I was like, oh my, he'd driven and yeah. found the stone in the graveyard and, and lifted it. I was like a kid at Christmas. You sent this on to me and I was like, I'm only an hour and a half away from here. You know, I'm living in Waterford and this is in, in Tipperary. It's like, I'm only an hour and a half away. Why wouldn't I go up? You know, so the next day free I had, which I think it was that Saturday, yeah. got up first thing and left the house at 6.30 a.m. And I was there and all at eight and I was looking around and I found what I thought was the mm. Lonergan stone first because it was a large stone sitting in the corner of the graveyard and I got a few pics on it, very heavy stone and I was like, yeah, no, that's it now and I put it up on, on YouTube and about a week later I got a, a message from somebody on YouTube saying, no, I live in that area. That's not the stone. The stone that Thomas Lonergan lifted was a, a large rectangular stone with engravings on it and it was more of a blue colour. So it was like, then a twig was like, I saw that stone there. Like, I use that as a step. When you get into the graveyard, you jump over a stile and there's a little, what I thought was a step mm. underneath that, just laying on the ground. Wasn't that Thomas Lonergan stone? So I go back up. The following Tuesday I'm off, which is about four days later. And I go back up and there it is, you know. And it was like, that's it there now. That's the first Irish mainland stone refound. You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah. I'm not going around finding these. This, these are things that have been there for hundreds of years. They've just been forgotten in the last exactly hundred years. That. You're just refinding them yeah. and putting them back on the map. Yeah, reanimating the... Reanimating being a great word for it. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, and, and there it was. And it's you Again, I brought the lifting, the, the, the weighing stuff, 177.5 kg. Mm. Another monstrous stone. But, I mean, it did say in it that nobody could lift that stone. Only Thomas. I mean, men came from all over the parish. Yeah. Right. Can I read that? Of course. Read this is from the volume. This is from the manuscript volume in the school's collection. So... This was written down the 26th of October, 1938. 38. And it was written down from a Michael Kyo who got it from, it just says Mr. Kyo, who at that age was age 45. So we can assume that Mr. Kyo was Michael, young Michael's father. So Michael was probably 11, there might 12. There be some relation because I'm Kyo and you know that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Which is cool. Uh, well. They live in Barrack Hill, Clohine in Tip and County Tipperary. So this is the piece. It says, a man named Thomas Lonergan was the strongest man in the parish. He could lift weights and big stones and irons. 
there is a stone in Shanrahan graveyard and men came from all around the district to lift the stone, but none of them could lift the stone, only Thomas Lonergan. He lived in the Bella and he died 10 years ago. So that was the first instance of, see, one of, one of the things which you should specify as well to people, which is important about this tradition, that the idea of like feats of strength and, and competitions of kind of athletics and strength are not uncommon in Irish tradition at all on occasions where there were gatherings and we can talk about mm. that a little some of the strange kind of occasions in which this the context in which stone lifting occurs but a lot of the material that that was lifted in former times were kind of ephemeral so you have a lot of accounts of men lifting uh, plows yes. men lifting harrows men lifting anvils men lifting large sacks of grain um, you know ca- carrying he- heavy objects but items or objects that are no longer in the natural landscape exactly and so there's a kind of ephemeral nature to that expression of, of a kind of um, uh, feat of strength but what's what we're specifically looking for in this instance are are noted stones like you said in scotland in a particular glen or, or associated with a certain family where generation after generation have been returning to mm. that's that's what we're that's what we're kind of trying to identify so that was the first one that um that i had found in the collections here that you then went and 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 lifted like it was astounding i couldn't couldn't believe it's it incredible i mean look and said look going back to the source here now you know written in 1938 and that man was dead 10 years when they were yeah so I mean when was that last lifted then it was exactly maybe, you know exactly. what I mean maybe 60 70 years before yeah, that yeah you know um, I want to read just briefly a few other brief accounts that we have just to show some again the scope of some and tone of some of the material and specifically you know you often hear in some of these narratives that stones were noted and attached to only certain individuals could lift them it yes. was only this one individual it's like a so, of strength exactly yeah. so we have sure Thomas Lonergan there's another one a stone lifter in Fahey in County Leitrim it says, James McMorrow of Fahey, Ballinaglera, County Leitrim, could lift a large stone that was in the townland of Fahey on the east shore of Lake Allen. This man is alive yet. He is about 90 years of age. That was in 1938. Oh, yes. No one could lift the stone but himself. Uh, another one collected in the same parish in Fahey in County Leitrim. Pat Mulvey of Drumrisk in Ballinaglera used to lift a big stone that was in Fahey. No man could lift it, only himself. Now in County Wexford. Jimmy Doran of Rathgory was able to write his name clearly and evenly on a whitewashed wall with a pencil with a half hundredweight ha- hanging out of his little finger. He was also able to lift a big stone and throw it in over the ditch and it took four men to roll it out again. The stone is still to be seen on the cross of Rathgory. The only other man to ever lift it off the ground was Pat Cullen. Uh, another one here, Clare Bridge in Abington, yes. it's southeast of Limerick City near, near Glenstall. And this describes lifting a flag at Clare Bridge. It says, we have not very... F- many famous men in this district. Uh, but one of the great stone lifters was John Coffey of Saragine. I can't find that town land at all, but John Coffey yeah. was this man's name. He used to lift a big flag at Clare Bridge and put it standing on the end of it. Strong men from all parts of the country used to come to try to lift it, but nobody was able to lift it but himself. I've looked on Google Maps, I think we've both been crawling on Google Maps to see I've been living on Google Maps. Is yeah. that stone still there? But again, even for people who are listening to this maybe who might be able to help out um, and might have heard of these sorts of I mean I'd imagine if the stone was lifted onto the bridge that's either in the river or it's nearby do you know it has to be somewhere close now you know a lot can happen in 100 to 150 years true 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 I've come, I've come across that with um, with finding other stones down in Kilbride and down in Glenmore um, you know like tarring roads and, and the stones getting thrown over ditches and, yeah. and forgotten about yeah, you know, yeah. or broken up by, by, by stone breakers or the other um, the other one I'll just kind of lead into like the, the context maybe that, that lurks in the background of some of these stones remember we were looking at there's a photograph that we have in, on, on Ducos of a large stone by a bridge in Newry near River Street in Newry yes and uh, at the bend of that bridge and there's a note from the folklore collector saying that this stone was taken from an old graveyard quote unquote and it was left it was sunk in just beside the bridge and that coffins were arrested on it to allow before the coffin bearers would, would go up to I think St Mary's is the church or near the graveyard or whatever for the funeral and that they'd stop and have a pint and they, they but it just looked curiously to me like potentially it was it had been a lifting stone that was taken from from yes. the, because a lot of these are found in, in graveyards is either is not graveyards true? is yeah I mean it's what's it's, going on there it seems to be um because like I said I think of it's either ten yeah it's eleven I found now eleven lifting stones in Ireland over the past um, eight months. Again, like I said, going through all the Ducas references, and I would say probably 75% of them are in graveyards. And really, really old graveyards. I'm not talking new graveyards. I mean, like I can tell you a couple of stories with the ones I found, but like they're in ancient graveyards. And I'm talking ancient as in the year 1200, you know, the year, the year 1000, the year 13, 1350, you know, going all the way back. Because I went over looking for a stone over an Inish man. 
I think about about maybe five weeks after looking for the one on Inish Moor, this was the second one I was going to find. And I heard tell that there was um, a stone, a lifting stone on Inish Man, so over we go. And I went over, I had no leads, Johnny, I had nothing, absolutely nothing, only I knew there was a stone there. That was it. So I hop onto the ferry, and I get up and just, I said, why are you going to do only ask? So I mean, the, the cabin crew were there, so excuse me, I, I explain myself and what I'm doing. They're like, I, I don't know, but see, see Mihal down the back there, um, we call him the king of the island. So Mihal was this, again, man in the 70s, big grey beard, sound asleep with a dog across his lap. Wake him up there and ask him, I'm not going to wake him up. I said, we're going to wake up a man from his sleep. I'll wake him up. He goes down and, and shoves him, you know, and Mihal goes up. He starts talking about it. Oh, I know about that. He said, yeah, um, I've heard of it. I don't know where it is, but sure, uh, sure, wouldn't Johnny know where it is? Sure, we'll ask him when we hop off the ferry. So I'm like, this is amazing. You know, so he's like, yeah, no. Um, so he goes over, he talks to this lad. The man was like, I know exactly where that is, yeah. Hop in the, hop in the van, Sean, I'll take you down. So myself and my, my son and my two friends were with me. We all hop up into this little kind of mini bus. And he drives us. Now, like I said, I, I would have probably gone to the graveyard because there, there seemed to be all found in graveyards. I would have been heading towards a graveyard anyway. But I would have been heading towards the new graveyard, the mm. one attached to the church. This one was on the, uh, the east side of the island and there was a little plaque on it and said this, this church is, was built around the year 1200. The graveyard was so ancient that there was no standing um, headstones. They were all flat, large, massive, flat um, gravestones. Mm. And there inside the wall was this beautiful black lump of, of um, your man said it was marble I don't think it was marble I think it was granite but again sitting there I said, and he said my granddad was the last man to lift this he said the true test the true test was to lift it up onto the wall and the wall now you're talking probably about from me about, about chest height a little over chest height mm. but he said uh, this is the, the real test of strength I said this was a great social signifier back in the day he said if you could lift this you got a massive amount of respect yeah um, Remember, my granddad said he lifted this particular stone and he didn't have to buy a drink on the island for six weeks, yeah. you know. So you become more respected. You know, the, the women might find you more attractive, the men respect you a little bit more, and you've suddenly gained a lot of social status yeah. by being able to lift these stones. Mm. And it was amazing that I just got welcomed in. When I started asking questions, you just got welcomed in by all these people. Yeah, yeah You know, yeah. and it's like, I would have never found this place, ever in a million years, because it's not signposted. It's well off the beaten track, well off the main road. It's about a five-minute walk down a little old dirt track to this incredible old, old churchyard. Mm. I mean, magic. Mm. You know, you know how beautiful the Iron Islands is anyway. But mm-hmm. This is like this old, old church, huge. I mean, I'm talking like massive slabs of uh, of gravestones. You know, because mm. I was like, how did even I was saying asking the man, I said, how did even you know get these gravestones? Where did they come from? They cut them down from the coastline. He said they weigh about maybe maybe four or five ton each. And the men used to carry them up on sticks and put the sticks underneath them and used to walk them up, hmm. you know? The stories. It's a testament to people's generosity, isn't it? And kind of, I was saying this to you again before we were chatting, we were ranting away at each other about the experience of collecting from people that you can meet people and, you know, an hour or, or two later after meeting them, you're kind of sitting around the kitchen table, drinking cups of tea and so on with people. But it's like all these kind of layers of curtains in their lives open and you're brought right into the, the, heart. the tabernacle of their yeah. own life. And they just give you the most golden beautiful kind of reminiscences and things it just it changes Johnny, your it perspective was, on everything yeah it was incredible and as i was lifting this stone there was men starting to walk from over the fields you know, the word had got out the tom tom drums had gone out there's a man over here lifting this stone and there was just men walking i seen them walking from east i seen them walking from west and they're coming over and then they're telling you their stories my great granddad lifted this or my granddad i lifted it myself or, you know this kind of stuff and they're all telling the stories and the, the younger men were there immediately they went over to see could they lift it it's you know, amazing, isn't it? it's That's amazing. all it takes. Like, and as well, in comparison, say, with other um, forms of kind of traditional physical culture, I'm thinking in particular of doing research here on, on traditional forms of folk wrestling, which are much, much harder. You, can't, you can hope to scope, uh, to look at the scope of the tradition, but you can't hope to reanimate it in the same way, I don't think, because there, there, there are different inputs, contexts and things that go into some of the different traditional sports but, yes. but for this you, just, you need to it's identify there. the site find it and then reconnect with it and then it's, uh, it's alive again it's, it's happening again That's there's it. one thing that you said there which I thought was really interesting about lifting the this stone had to be lifted onto the wall onto the wall it was and, a, and that's a true test yeah. that's the thing like the idea one of the, the kind of the motifs or something that you see in the context of stone lifting um, I haven't noticed it much in Ireland except that you say it there uh, is the idea of lifting a stone onto a plinth as a test? Isn't there, the, you know, the, in, in Iceland, weren't there the stones for um, the Dritvik stones? The Dritviks. For the fisherman's pay. 
That's a low that's the one third or half pay or full pay. If yep. you could lift it onto a certain, wasn't it onto a plinth? Um, they were, they were saying it was onto a plinth, but I mean, now it's just, there's no plinth there, now it's just chest height. But I mean, you had yeah, yeah, you had the weakling stone, the amlodi, which was 23 kilos. You had the half um, dreitinger, which was 54. Then you had the half sterker, which was half strong, that was 100. And you had the full sterker, which was full strong, which was 154. And whatever one you lifted, it determined how you. much money you got and how good a provider Here's, or a husband you were. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Your strength was your worth. Like, the, the strongest men, the strongest oarsmen were put in the middle of the boat. So if you were the stronger man, you were put into the middle of the boat, which means you got more money. Mm. It just, it's interesting that you're having to, having to raise it onto a plinth. And we see, we do see descriptions as well of... The pewter rock stone in Scotland. Is that, that another one? Mm. Um, and the sense of maybe different lifts up to your knees or then up to your shoulders or then onto your shoulders and then being able to cast it from there as well. Yeah. Um, and I want to give just a thanks as well to my friend Tom over in Devon. He, he mentioned to me, he gave me some information concerning his time stone lifting in Sweden, where he oh, described yes. it, that it was a test for the strength of prospective farm workers and they'd be asked to lift stones and carry them and that the distance that they could carry the farm's stone would determine whether they classed as quote-unquote strong or quote-unquote half-strong, and this determined their pay. That's incredible. So that, That's the same. It's the same. It's a kind of variant of the same tradition. So I haven't found anything in Ireland related to that, but even the motif of maybe lifting something onto a lifting something onto a plinth, or we saw the guy in Abington Limerick he'd lift it onto a bridge, yes. that it's lifted up, raised up to, up to a certain point or whatever. Um, I want to go back to, to what you were saying about, um, there's a kind of, million strands going to my brain here I know, yeah. about um the, the funerals and so when we when when i was finding some of these and we were kind of back and forth on instagram and sending some different accounts over i was struck by the fact that time and again this material was kind of coming up in relation to 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 uh, old graveyards basically and i looked in uh, one of the book i have at home o'curry's manners and customs of the ancient irish and in it, he talks about uh, death in, in ancient Ireland. And there was just slightly like tantalizing snatches of information where it's, it's, it's obviously, you need to kind of resist the urge to draw enormous conclusions to these things yeah. necessarily. But in it, when talking about death in ancient Ireland, O'Curry says this, he, he refers to funeral games, basically. And I just want to read this for a second. He says, when the cremation or interment of the corpse and the clicha which literally means the, the lamenting games, the, the mourning games, the funeral games, yeah. Uh, when the clicha or the mourning part of the ritual of the dead were completed, the kritachfuat or funeral games commenced. From the use of this word to describe the games instituted by Achilles in honour of Patrocles, it is probable that the wrestling, foot races, etc., practised at the Eanach or for fair, constituted the kritachfuat. The clicha or mourning, the druidic or other sacred ceremonies, and the kritachfuat or games appear to have been included under the collective name of Nosa or which the Nosa Lunasa, or games celebrated at Taltu on Lammas Day, are an example. So Talta is the fair, the huge and the royal fair in Meath. Right. And that was celebrated. The Talta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The Talton games, and yes. kind of reinvigorated. Um, and Lunasa, Nosa Lunasa, Lunasa is kind of Lammas, so it's like the 1st of August. Garland Sunday is yes. how it's the last Sunday in July yeah. is celebrated. So it's made the jump into Christian tradition now. The most obvious example would be the thousands of pilgrims, tens of thousands, who climbed the Reek Cruelforic on Garland Sunday. Yes. So on, on Garland Sunday, there's the ascent to hilltops. And, and as people ascend to those hilltops, they would, when the community come together, they would in, in, engage in kind of games, that's courtship, fantastic. feats of athletics, feats of strength and so, so on. That's why they're in graveyard. Wrestling right? seemed to have taken part and then also different kinds of uh, athletics. But, but specifically what I found interesting was the idea of, of funeral games, of games yeah. that are uh, contests that take part at a funeral in particular. So it was only a small kind of reference, but there's so it, it opens up so much though because I mean, like I said, I'm, I found so many of these in graveyards, and like that gives some kind of an explanation well, there, of why they're there. Then. there then there's another. So this is this is a text I found. This is a text called a Highland Parish, the history the history of Fording Gauls. So this is from uh, across the water, in Scotland. This is by Alexander Stewart. This is a book from 1928. And there's a brief excerpt on page 158 of this book. It talks about festivities and it's talking about the kind of social context of people celebrating and marking rites of passage and so on. And um, where are we now? In it, it says, so it's talking about different festivities. I'll read this piece out. It says, but the festivities in connection with baptisms were insignificant compared with those that took place at funerals and late wakes. To such an extent did these go, and so great was the expense incurred, even by poor families in connection with them, that towards the close of the 18th century, the clergy found it necessary to forbid excessive feasting and drinking at such sad gatherings. Similar happened in Ireland. Mm. 
When funerals went long distances, it was not uncommon for those attending them to be so much under the influence of drink that the remains of loved ones had to be consigned to the grave with indecorous haste. We do not know anything specially scandalous that took place in the parish on such occasions, but scenes often occurred which were not altogether seemly. When the remains of Helen Lindsay, the widow of Captain Campbell of Glen Lyon, were laid out for burial at Chest Hill, there was a great gathering of kinsmen and retainers, and they were entertained for several days. The young men assembled, spent their time in such games as tossing the caber and putting the stone. These old customs, however, gradually died away, and for the past three quarters of a century, the practices of the people, in this parish at any rate, have been more in keeping with the mournful character of such occasions. So again, there's just... It's the there's something, there's an outline of, of, um, of references to these, I suppose, the context in which some of these lifts occur as being connected with... with it's amazing that there's... Funerals a, or death customs in a way, um, and that they're then located in these very old graveyards. And in a sense, we were asking before we were chatting here, is that because it's a way, in, in a symbolic sense, you know, as we kind of speculate widely, is it something that's so the opposite of death, you know what I mean? Expression of vitality and a kind of life. And which, you know, may be the case or makes natural sense in a way, but also it's likely that it's just the practicalities of one of the few occasions when everyone in the community from a large distance were brought together all of a sudden. That's men it. and women as onlookers and well. So then you had, obviously, when men get together, there, it's going to be, can you do that? Can, I, I bet you can do that. Exactly, I bet you can't. Exactly, and then, exactly, then off you go. Exactly. And that's why, like, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, people only met up maybe like that in, in large groups i mean at large funerals are certain on the or, or say or yeah exactly or or uh, the metal when when it was time for kind of communal cooperative rural labor when you have x amount of acres to be mown and well all the neighbors come around and help you do that but at that stage there's actually there's work to be done so we're doing that work as opposed to just we're not kind of standing around in a sense you know exactly and that's like one i found in Oak Rim, um that it was is at, this elfin? at elfin, elfin yeah, yeah at elfin yeah. church stone throwing was practiced every sunday either before or after mass yeah, yeah you know yeah and it said then in elk rim graveyard there's a big stone which funerals used to used to go there all the strong men used to test their strength by lifting the stone and paddy dolan seemed to have lifted one stone on top of another and to show his great strength that he was about seven feet tall he could pick up both stones and then he picked up this stone and threw it out over the the graveyard wall which it, where it lay until i found it there about three months ago tell us about can you tell us about that how, how that went how you found it I mean, like, like, first of all, like these things, I mean, you get about maybe five lines of text and then you're trying to sieve that down into an actual place. So I found Oak Rim, because like I said, all these graveyards are old. Some of these graveyards aren't even on Google Maps, you know? So, but thankfully Oak Rim Graveyard was. So I get up to the place and it's, he said he'd thrown it outside of the wall and outside of the wall, about maybe four feet out, were just bramble bushes. The whole way up, maybe about a hundred yards on both sides. I'm like, okay, this is going to be a bit awkward. Look at the gods was with me this day because I have I have the slash hook with me, and after about 20, 20 feet of cutting, I just got a clang, and I pull it all back, and there's this beautiful big boulder. I clear another bit just to see, and I just there was absolutely nothing. Do you know what I mean? you can look under bramble hedges sometimes? Mm -hmm. There's nothing up the, the uh, that side, nothing up the other side, nothing on the front. I was like, that's the only boulder that's here. I was like, that has to be it, mm. and it weighed enough that you, like estimated about one hundred fifteen kilos that you're like. If a man put another stone on top of that, he could possibly lift both, you know? Yeah. But it's like, that's the Oak Rim stone there then, yeah. you know? And it's amazing, that stone looks, the area is the exact mirror image of the Newtown Moor stone over in Scotland. The mirror image, a beautiful old tree, the stone is sitting under the tree. It's on a mass path over in Newtown Moor, over in, over in, um, in Scotland. Over here, it's in a graveyard. Both stones are pretty much the exact same shape. They're almost the exact same weight. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that one was like, that and the Scottish one, there was such a tie in there, it, was, it blew my mind to what, be honest. What with was you. your time before with the coffin roads in Scotland or something? What, can you explain it to me? I don't. I, don't, what, um, what, I, I only have a small inkling myself, but talking to, to Jamie and to Martin over there, it was, like, it was like a mass path. So, what that was, okay. was that's our equivalent of the mass path. Exactly. And a, a, a route path. that was taken a route. to the graveyard. That's exactly okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. And what they used to do was they used to stop on a, a mass stone. Um, or leave, this, leave the, the coffin on a particular stone. Like that one in Newry. Exactly. And then they would have another stone there that it would use for, like you were saying, with the, uh, the funeral games. They would use them as tests of strength for the men. Oh, so there's the tie-in again, yeah. you know? Yeah. So like that one particularly was a great find because it's like that really ties into Scottish and Irish well, brotherhood. This, see, you know? And this is the fantastic thing as well because we have, like, we're so lucky with, the, the, with the, the work of the Folklore Commission to document so many aspects of our traditional culture and inheritance because now, you know, 
okay, we have, um, you know, cousins across the water in Iceland, Scotland, England, Wales, Cornwall, and there are varying degrees of the tradition there yeah. that have been that have been noted. But we're in a position to really, I suppose, we're blessed. Ex- explore and reanimate and identify this stuff, and, and then to take pride in it and to to re I think I said to, to kind of to reanimate it. You mentioned there in, in connection with the Ockram graveyard uh, Sunday. As a, I think it mentioned that people would test their, their strength. The trials of strength. And that's yeah. something you see time and again as well. That it's, keeps it's coming Sunday up. Sunday it keeps coming up, yeah. I want to read you a, a, a piece here. I think I sent this to you already on Instagram, but I'll read it out for, for listeners. Yeah. This is from Irish Wake Amusements by Sean O'Sullivan. So Sean O'Sullivan, a total hero, he was the first archivist for the Irish Folklore Commission. Um, and he had a particular interest in, in wake games and wake amusements. So when we were, when we were looking at this, oh, trying to look at the connection between funeral games and so on, I just took a look at this book and there's a chapter in it called Contests in Strength, Agility, Dexterity, Accuracy of Aim, Endurance and Toughness, Hardihood and Athletics. Right, rolls off the tongue. Love this, yeah. So it gives all these different games, lifting the corpse, uh, pulling the stick, uh, lifting a chair and so on and so on. But what I found fascinating was his little his brief introduction to this piece, which goes as follows. It says, men of physical prowess have always been held in high esteem in every country. This was so in Ireland too, and it continues to this day. Hurlers, footballers and athletes are very popular. In times gone by, men of unusual strength received similar acclaim. I well remember the attempts made by men of my native parish in Kerry in my young days to raise from the ground individually a heavy block of concrete, a portion of a fallen gate pillar. Many tried it and failed on Sunday evenings when they had leisure. It weighed about 100 weight and remained firmly on the ground until a low-sized man, whom nobody regarded as being strong, succeeded one evening in raising it to his knees. From that time on, he was hailed as a champion weightlifter, although his modesty did not allow him to show off. As contests of various kinds formed part of the traditional pattern of sport in rural Ireland, it is not to be wondered at that they were also popular features of wakes and funerals. So again, it's just such a nice... It's it's just... It's the, the, I suppose we see Sunday time and again as a time for lifting. And then you also have the, the kind of the, the funeral as a context in which these games, these games. And I love the fact that they're heroes. You know, I mean, these guys are, are called local heroes because before the, the, the times of superheroes, before any of this kind of thing, you had your local hero who would do something spectacular. And that now, I suppose, you know, if you think about the, the frame of reference, when we think in terms of heroes or athletic heroes, it's often at a national level. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you've achieved that in your own, in your own kind of um, achievements. Yeah, I think, I think I want notoriety for yeah, it. it. It's, but it's, I it's think at, a national, it's at a national yeah, yeah, level yeah. or an international level. Yeah. Our, our heroes are at that level. Whereas when we look at these accounts, it's at a much, much more localized level. Every parish, every every townland had its own. There's something no, beautiful noted, about that. Noted too. poets, singers, yeah. like I said, versifiers. Um, strong men, mowers, walkers, runners, leapers. Like there's a really, there's a really. There's much more, I suppose, diversity in it and an array of different skills and attributes and people being noted for different things. That's wonderful. And, and, and how that relates you to your own, your own local... Your own area, Dillick says, yeah, area. exactly. I want to, uh, to read a piece from Sean O'Sullivan again. This is from the Handbook of Irish Folklore um, and there's a section in it on, on challenges. So the Handbook of Irish Folklore, to explain to people who might not know, it's a 699-page guidebook for folklore collectors on all aspects of life. And Sean O'Sullivan, who, who he, he, I just read out that piece from him, he was the first archivist for the Folklore Commission, and he compiled this as a guide for folklore collectors. Okay. So there's thousands of different topics with thousands upon thousands of questions for folklore collectors to ask, and all of the questions were based on material that had come in from the field, or the vast majority of them anyway. So they're not just kind of shots in the dark. They're kind of right. Like, so you can learn a lot about any topic just by, by reading the questions in this book. So here's a section on challenges. It says, A great many stories are told in Ireland about challenges, contests, feats of agility, strength and endurance, and tests of all kinds. Almost every district boasts of some champion who won fame for himself and his birthplace by his prowess. Accounts of all such people and events should be written down. So when we go on to the section on contests and feats, there's a section on feats of strength. And it says, Write down any accounts you can obtain of great feats of strength performed by local champions. In each case, it would be well to give the name and address of the person who performed the exploit, if known, as well as the circumstances. Give an account of any families whose members were famous for their prowess. Was some epithet applied to individuals or to families on account of their strength, i.e. Lauder or Sandow, etc.? The different ways in which strength may be shown are innumerable. The following are a few suggestive lines of inquiry. 
Weightlifting of heavy stones, logs of wood, sacks, anvils in a forge. Hero lifts the anvil by the snout with one hand. Straightening of heavy objects, raising them above the head with one or both hands was also a well-known test of strength. Uh, full details should be given of feats of strength performed in any of these ways. Weight throwing, different types, shoulder cast, sledge, cluch vasha, etc. Carrying heavy burdens, heavy sacks, logs, ploughs, coffins, persons or animals, etc. Heavy burdens carried under great difficulties, up a cliffside or stairway, over a bad road, against a high wind, etc. Restraining or taming strong animals, holding back a horse by the leg, holding a bull by the horns, overcoming a wolf, this killing with a good. single blow of the fist, tug of war contests. Isn't it savage? But that's just fantastic. And I, and I want to touch on something you said there. You said something about gaining notoriety for himself, his family or his birthplace. His birthplace. I mean, yeah, yeah. let's crack on with this one from County uh, Westmead. There's a stone called the Langan, the Langan Stone that a man called Paddy Langan of Bloomfield was the strongest man in the area and he carried a massive stone from a neighbourhood house to a graveyard. And the, the crossroads was named after him afterwards, called the Langan Crossroads. No way. Because he'd done that, you know? And this stone, like, I went up and um, it weighs 190 kilos. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest lifting stones in the world, one of mm. the heaviest in the world. I mean, you think the Husafell stone, which is really well known over in Iceland, I mean, he was the world's strongest man and that weighs 186, I think, or 187 kilos. And this is heavier. And this, this dude, Paddy Langan, went and picked this thing up and took it for a walk, you know? <laughs> and, oh, you should see the place. This place, I mean, I, I read again on Dukas, again from, from Dukas, which is just an amazing, an amazing sight, um, that, that this man picked up this stone and took it for a walk. And he said, men will count themselves good men if they then carry that stone. Mm. Um, and they said to weigh 42 stone weight. I was like, that sounds a little bit excessive. But... Um, I was looking up this place where we're going to find it and it was like it's in County Westmeath and I saw there was about maybe three or four graveyards around this area so I picked one that looked likely and I was going to head up there this was on the Wednesday I was going to head up on the Saturday this is the clan fad this is the clan fad one yeah. yeah and what happened then only the next day on the, I think it was on the Thursday I got a phone call out of the blue from a man called Warren McGeegan and Warren is an expatriate he lives over in Canada but like he's from Ireland and I think he's moving back with his Canadian wife and kids but he was like, I'm back on holidays. I think I found uh, the Clan Fadstone or the Langenstone. Out of the blue, Johnny. And I was going to head there in three days time no to way. find it. I was like, sure, isn't that serendipity? I mean, that's serendipity. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. meant to happen, yeah. you know? And I was like, where is it? And he, he, she gave me the GPS coordinates for this place. And it, it, the, the graveyard was so old, it wasn't even on Google Maps. It was just a circle of trees just off the main road. So I get to this place and we, we go through this hedgerow. It's like this, it's almost like a secret gate. You go through this, this gap in the hedgerow and you walk into this field and it's just, just this circle of trees and that's a, a six foot circular wall. And there's a style, a four, a four stone style that you stand over and then you're into this place and it's like stepping back into the past, you know, it's like stepping into a different era. Mm. There's, there's some of the gravestones here were like from the like 1700s, 1600s, 1800s, you know, you're like, this is, ancient ancient mm. and it was a beautiful sunny day and you could see the shafts of sunlight coming down through the trees and there was this they described it as an egg-shaped stone there was this egg-shaped stone sitting on the ground in front of a um a, a gravestone i was like it was like something from from the start of indiana jones the first film you know what i mean it's like i can't believe it from, from like a little a little right four or five lines in Dukas to actually getting up and seeing this stone, you know, this beautiful egg-shaped stone. Yeah. And it's incredible. You know, yeah. and we waited, like I said, we brought the lifting straps, we waited at 190 kilos. And there it is, yeah. you know? Yeah, there's something thrilling. It gives me goosebumps listening to you talk about it. Like, because I remember being brought to see a holy well on this man's land, Eddie O'Neill's his name, in, in Wicklow. And it was a well across, across several fields on his land. And it's the same, there's a big, huge hedge and there's a tiny gap in yeah. it. And you just go down almost into the earth and it opens up. There's this huge, the biggest holly tree, ancient old holly tree, beautiful well, cut out a square and kind of thing in the ground, a uh, statue to Our Lady, a little shrine where people worship it. And it's just like, oh my God, it, it's here. It's, but we had manuscript accounts of his grandfather and their family tending the well for generations. And there I am with Eddie. So it, it takes it from, it's, it's so exciting when you, when you see something written down on the page, these snatches of material. But when you then go into the natural landscape and see lying in disuse and quiet fields, yeah. and yet the power of these places, and you're standing there, and you can feel the... Oh, the, the, I, the I, I, I'll never forget, the, the hairs were standing up, the short hairs were standing up over the back of my hands, my arms. Mm. It was like, it was it was magic. It was mm. absolutely magic finding this one. Mm. But I mean, I'll tell you, my favourite one, I know I, I ramble, I talk a lot. No, it's a total pleasure. But there's, um, 
the one I'm most excited about that I found was um, one up in County Mayo, which is actually has mythological um, toys, you know, the Clochondra, mm-hmm. which um, I'm going to tell you about this because this was just incredible. I was, I was hoping, Johnny, hoping, 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 um, because I've been to many, many sites where, you know, when you look up Dukas, like say Fionn McCool has thrown a large boulder from the mountaintop, yeah. and that boulder now sitting in a field, and the boulder could weigh like 60 tons, or yeah. it could weigh like 40 tons, or be the size of a small car. You know, and I've, I've visited a lot of these sites around Ireland, um, giants throwing stones, yeah, giants putting stones, yeah. you know, giants they're everywhere. They are everywhere. They're yeah. everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. I mean, just a book in it alone, there's hundreds of them around the place. And I visited a load, and all of them were, were massive. And I was just, imagine if there was a giant's throwing stone that was also used as, as a strength test by men, by normal men, mm-hmm. you know? And what did I come across? Because I, like, I, I just keep going through Dukas. I type in stone as a keyword, you get 12,017 references yeah, pages yeah. you know and there's 10 on each page but I come across this one called the clock under up in County Mayo mm. oh here we are here we are once there was a giant in Okagower and he had a pushing stone which is 300 and a half in weight he used to throw it over his shoulder and he used to send it as far as another man would send a pebble the stone is there yet and the trace of his fingers is in it a great many strong men spend their leisure time trying to lift the stone and I was like that's it that's the bridge between mythology and and physical now, culture, traditional physical culture that's that's the bridge that's mm. it so I was like is that there I, I I have to see if that's there straight away I got onto a friend of mine who lives in Mayo could you go down and see in Okagawa and she said yeah I'm only 15 minutes away a woman called Celine King Celine said I'll go down the weekend and have a look for you and see um, so she goes down and there it is in the middle of the village green being used as a seat this said that's it there she said there's the clock under um, the, giant, the giant stone but it was sitting on four stone legs i was like oh god i hope that thing is not cemented into the legs there'd be no way to be able to lift it then you know mm. and she said I, I can't do it i can't pick it up it's too heavy i'm not going to check if it's, if it's sitting on these legs so i get in contact with elka gower on facebook town council and i phone them up and i ask him after our initial like what the hell is this guy talking about this man says no that's just that stone's just sitting on those little legs that we're using it as a seat i explained who i am and what i want to do oh my god he said that's fantastic uh, when are you free i said i'm going to come up on saturday like, because I mean, I'm buzzing here with the thought of it. You know what I mean? I'm going to come up on Saturday. I want to see this thing. You know, I'm at come up house in, right now. I won't be there on Saturday. I'm going to I'm coming up anyway. So I go up, and Johnny, you drive into Okagawa, and it's like driving into something from the 15th century. And you got this incredible round tower, just perfectly intact round tower. You got uh, an old ruined cathedral. You got Celtic crosses. This is like the if you. A, a, a stone bridge like a river like if, if you thought quintessential Irish village this is it a couple of little old pubs I was like this place is magic and I drive in and there's the giant stone sitting in the middle of the village green I, like it's available to lift I, I move it off the plinth and you can see the fingerprints of the giant's hands are in it you know what I mean whether it's true or not what a story yeah, you know what I mean yeah, yeah. you can see these actual like hand marks yeah. in the top of the stone where you squeeze it like soft clay yeah. and like that is the bridge between reality and mythology <laughs> and it's there yeah. you know I got a couple of lifts on it again like I said it's just a tiny lift because it weighs about 180 182 kilos but I'm like this thing is so incredible and as I was lifting it out came this man who lived about 100 yards down the road and he was like First of all, kind of what are you doing? And then I tell him what I was doing. It was like, I, I've, I know the name of the stone, but I never really knew a lot about it. And then I was like, do you see that stone there? I said, that's magic. I said, that stone, is the story is magic. I said, the history, the mythology. I said, you haven't even got a plaque. You know what I mean? Let's get a plaque up there. So I'm going to make this place, I'm going to put this place on the map. So I immediately got on to the town council. I said, I want to have a festival to do with this stone. I want to get Irish strongman. I want to get Scottish strongman. I want to get him over here and lift this stone and make something of it. Because it's got one of the best stories of stone lifting in the whole world. I mean, it's, it was thrown by a giant. You know what I mean? Mm. So I'm actually organising a festival next year on the 8th of July. Sorry, sorry. the 8th, Yeah, the 8th of July next year in Elkagower. Of all the Irish, the top five Irish strongmen are going to come. And see, can I get a few lifts on this stone? I've Scottish strongmen coming over. I'm going to try and get Irish music there. I'm going to try and get local food. Make it a big Irish festival around this stone because it's it's a crying shame that I've been nothing done with it so yeah. far. But let's let's take this and, and go forward. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, 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 amazing. So anybody, if you're around next year, come up. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, know? it's uh, oh, it's amazing. One of the one of the 
the common things that you see again and again in tradition concerns either yeah fiona the fiona or kind of random giants yes. or old hags kalyach vera akahorda has a kalyach vera the kind of the hag of vera this kind of ancient what would you call her earth crone yes. mother type figure and there are lots of sites across the natural landscape associated with her where the story is that she she drops these huge boulders from her apron and that's why they're they're scattered all all all, all over the place um thinking of say Loch Crew, Schlieth and Collie is Hag Mountain. Right. And she was associated with that that kind of that whole environment, that landscape. But the idea that she's kind of walking across the landscape and that she she drops these from her um That's that love, I love all there's this. another Sorry. there's another one uh, what's it called? Cluch na Timpain. So the the stone of the bell, it's in it's near Ockram Gregor, near in Elfin as well. Right. And Fionn McCool is walking home. He's trying to get to a dinner in Elfin apparently and he has this big stone on his shoulder. Yeah. Uh, and he hears the bell, the dinner bell being rung in Elfin, and he takes three huge steps towards the town of Elfin, and he drops the stone, and it's sta- it's a standing stone in the field ever since, and it's called the Stone of the Bell. Isn't that just stones. fantastic? Yeah. You know, but like you said, the, the majority of these sorts of stones, you have lots of stones associated with saints where the marks of their knees, knees as they're praying, or their, or their yeah. hands, or whatever, are visible. Um, but a lot of those ones, I suppose, they're beyond the realms of... They're way too big. Yeah, way too big. Yeah, but so, th- th- so there's so a way of... find that crossover, which is yeah, exactly. Magic. Yeah, 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 amazing. But there's one, like, there's one like that in Scotland. I mean, um, my friend Jamie went and found this one in Scotland, which is called... Um, it's actually to do with the, the Leah Fall as well. Hmm. He said that Manon MacLear, uh, the King of the Sea, Manon asked the, the son of Quilty, Iquilty, who was a Fomorian giant, to bring back the Leah Fall back to to Ireland and he eventually brings it back but he, he was given a time frame he didn't do it within the time frame and he said as a Manon was not pleased with the quilter he returned one year and one day too late so tell him as a punter you have to lift a large black stone to his shoulder and carry it to the top of the higher, highest spire of his palace and that black stone is still there in North Uist in Scotland you know mm-hmm. My friend Jamie went, he knew it was a, a specific area, he found that black stone. And there's again, there's mythology and, and reality mixing, mm. you know. It's not just here, it's everywhere. The same in Oystan with the leg stain, the tombstone, mm. where like the, the man, the lazy farmer. The farmer, and he, and he, he X amount of reps yeah. until he gets to heaven. The lazy family. farmer, so like, I mean, if he could lift this stone, that he'd be given all the wealth in the world. He couldn't lift the stone, so the devil took his soul and buried him under a stone. Mm. But the local deacon or priest said, look, if you can release this man, whoever, when we ever get 100 revolutions of this 220 kilo uh, leg stain or tombstone, um, his soul will be free. And I think there's about 74 documented rotations there now. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, eventually in the next couple of years, that guy's soul will be free. God bless him. You know? not far off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's they're uh, wonderful tales. I mean, that's what I love about these. They're not just stones. They're touchstones exactly. to our history. They're yeah, lone stones to, yeah. our, to our culture yeah. and our heritage, yeah. you know? Um, I want to run through, just again, to just throw as many of these out, and names of people as well. Some other accounts. So we're talking about about, uh, about Sunday and so on, but um, uh, here's another account. This is from Drimmel League in County Cork. It oh. says, Long ago there was a big heavy stone on my father's land. Every Sunday, a large crowd again, Sunday again. Every Sunday, a large crowd used to gather to try to lift it. A certain man offered one pound to the man who could lift it as high as his own shoulder. This enticed larger crowds to lift it. A great many people strained themselves in the attempt. At last, a man named Sweeney lifted it. His name was Timothy Sweeney, Inch and Gerrig, Drimmel League. He was the only man who could lift it. He is now dead. I think I found that field. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. Again, Google Maps all over the place. Yeah. But I think I found yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The other... The other um, I suppose kind of major ones really that you've that you found are also we in are, are described in, in good detail in the yeah. in the schools collection or in County Cavan, the flags of Den. Oh, what a story! Um, I'm going to read a few accounts out here, so if you'll bear with me, just take a couple of minutes to go through these to give the background. The flags of Den were situated on Carrigaboy Hill, overlooking Den Old Graveyard in a field presently owned by Mr. Michael Cow. Under those three flags were supposed to lie the remains of three saints. And at that time, this place was recognised as the saint's bury- burying ground. Convenient to this place, there were three blessed wells. The good old people at that time, when afflicted in any way, used to go pray at these flags, where a cure was always obtained. But later on, some evildoers began, as with a charm, to turn the stones so as to bring misfortune on their neighbours. That's a very common mm. practice, cursing stones. The cursing stone, yeah. I found that in Mayo in an old graveyard, in a baptismal font, there were little... Um, 
statues of Our Lady that you would turn turn the stone back, and turn curse. clockwise and curse and but you, yeah so you would curse your I think one, where I'm from in, in Walter and Bonland is one there these as well. things are still there they're still, still there still drawn yeah. um, sorry where was it so uh, people began with the charm to turn the stones to bring misfortune upon their neighbours this rose a lot of trouble and the landlord of that time being a Mr Percival the then Protestant minister ordered his son to go and break these flagstones which he did and in a short time, this young man shot himself in his own room in his father's house. And to this day, his blood stains remain on the wall in the present den rectory. There's a common thing that you find a mm. kind of some sort of supernatural retribution yeah. for something. So it's more representative of popular opinion than, than anything that might have actually necessarily occurred. After this, one of the wells moved about a half a mile and the bush that was over it went also. That's another very common motif for a desecrated well will jump and will move. Or sometimes churches move if they're, if they're kind of offended, basically, by yeah. people. It is at present in a field belonging to Mrs. Fegan in Leggan Den, where several people go for water up to the present day to effect a cure. Once there was a man living in Pullabon named Jackson. One day he broke the flags of Den. This is another account that gives a different man who was guilty of oh, breaking these okay. stones. The flags of Den were big stones lying on the top of a hill over the graveyard under which saints are supposed to be buried. When he had this done, he went up to Lavi and hung himself. The same motif again. Yeah. Kind of, uh, retribution again. Yeah, exactly, yeah. retribution and then, and then taking his own life. The people brought his body down and buried it in Den Graveyard. One Sunday morning, the Catholics threw the coffin across the ditch because they wouldn't allow him to be buried on consecrated ground. The Protestants buried him again, but the Catholics threw him out again. The Protestants buried him in the drain outside the graveyard and a heap of stones marks where he lies. Mm. Then this third and final account concerning these stones. This graveyard, situated in the lower end of the parish of Den, was closed in 1937 and a new one consecrated beside it. It must have been in use for centuries, for all knowledge of the burial ground used before its time has been forgotten. In it, there are some large stones which are, lone lo which are well known locally as the flags of Den. In former years, the strong men of the parish challenged each other after mass on Sundays. So again, again same motif. And at funerals, same thing again, yeah. to lift these stones off the ground. About half a dozen men are known to have lifted them to their knees, the last man to do it being Larry Highland of Banahoe. In my opinion, the stones, two of them, weigh about 500 weights. Yeah. There is a superstition connected with the flags to the effect that if, with the invocation of the devil, they are turned over with the intention of doing a neighbour harm, some misfortune is sure to overtake that neighbour. Loss of injury or cattle is said to be the usual form of misfortune. Many instances are given of such ill luck. So there's a lot going on. There's a on lot about the account. flags of Den. There was a lot about the flags. I also found a story by my man called Michael Clark, who picked it up, put it on his back, carried it to the local pub, was given a whiskey, drank the whiskey, and then brought it back to the graveyard. You know, and that was written under, under, under again, the branch of local heroes. Yeah, yeah. I came across that one. So you, and you went up, you, you travelled to that graveyard. I went you, up. You found those stones. I went up because it gave a description of what it was like. Said, um, um, some more references where the stone was thrown from, from uh, Schlieve Lake, um, which is about three kilometres away. And it, it gave the, the colour, said it's a possible brown colour with a carved cross in it, sandstone. So I was like, right, now I have a description. So I drove up to, to Cavan, which is a nice drive from Waterford, and I get to the place, and I, I, get, I get to the local church, thinking it might be around behind the newer graveyard, no joy. So I was kind of rooting around the, local, the few, few fields around, I was there, but I never couldn't find anything, till eventually this older man comes to the church, and I ask him, I said, look, I'm looking for the old graveyard um, here. He said, oh yeah, it's not here, he said, it's a kilometre down the road on the right-hand side. He said, there's the newer one, but the old one is across the road from that again, he said, but it's very, very overgrown. Are you from the county council to cut it? I said, I'm not. And I explained what I was looking for. I was looking for the flags of Den. Oh, I heard them, he said, but I've never seen one. Again, this man was an old man. He'd never seen it. So he said, um, I've heard stories about them. He said, I've never seen it. I don't know if they're there. And he said, you're going to do very well to find it because it's an extremely overgrown old graveyard. Mind your, mind your footing. So I get up to the place and I'm not joking, Johnny, the weeds were eight feet tall. Out with the slash hook again. Slash hook. <laughs> and I said, right, it's about maybe an acre and a half and I'm just going to cut my way through this and see what I can find, you know. So I start what and I now know wasn't at the other side where I should have started and I cut my way through, line by line, through the whole graveyard. It took me about two and a half hours of cutting and poking, finding some stones, sandstone, but they were all headstones. You knew there was carving in them. You know, there was dates in them, there was names in them. So after about two and a half hours, I was really tired and was like, you know, between the driving and hacking your way through these really like poorly underfoot and stuff like that. But up in the top left hand side of the graveyard, I see a big load of ivy and I start cutting through that clang and 
I push back the ivy and I see the bottom of a cross carved into this stone. I was like, oh my God, this, this could be it, this could be it. Um, pull back all the ivy from the stone and it was a, a perfect flagstone. It just had um, uh, one cross etched into it. It was brown sandstone and there was no names or dates or, and I said, that's it. That's the flag, one of the flags of then. And beside that, I found another one which was broken. So that ties in with the story. So I found one that was broken and one that was intact. And uh, what a weight. I mean, you could say it was five, 500 weights. I mean, anyone thinks like 100 weight is roughly 50 kilos. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So I mean, five, that's 250 kilos. Like, mm. You know, that's a fair weight. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's massive. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I was thinking, I'm thinking maybe it's around the 220. Because I mean, I couldn't get one one budget. I could flip it up and flip it over, but I couldn't pick it up. Mm. You know, I mean, it'd take a very very strong man to pick that thing up, like. But to to, to actually find it and to to pull away this ivy and see the cross, and like, that's it. That's yeah. the flag of then. You know, unbelievable, incredible. Unbelievable. It was magic. Yeah. It wasn't these magic moments. It's like I remember, like in, in Indiana Jones and like the, the Last Crusade. You know, where he finds the flagstone. Under under Venice, you know, he finds that flag so he's getting all excited. I was exactly what the point of this cross and the stone, and, you know, it was just absolutely magic. Yeah, savage. You yeah. know, Amazing. and then just what I get is that people online they were like, ah, nobody could lift that. You know, no man back in the day should. Weren't they all weak men? Mm. You know, they were none of them as strong as us. And people have this thing now that they believe that we're the pinnacle, we're the best, we're the strongest, we're the most enduring who ever lived. No, we are not. The I want to. I want to in agreement if you bring in a piece from the Hammock of Irish Folklore of Sean O'Sullivan's which always resonated with me I like this description he talks about comparison between successive generations and okay. this is another area for folklorists to collect on um, so if us find this but he speaks to that topic of the idea that well we're the pinnacle we're at the top Yeah. Um, but he suggests that in tradition it is often actually that there's a kind of degeneration of sorts taking place from generation to generation which is described here. It says, comparison between successive generations. Middle-aged and elderly people have a habit of making comparisons between the character and behavior of the local people in their own youth and those of the present generation. Such comparisons are generally unfavorable to the latter. The good old times and the fine people <laughs> have gone, they say, and their places are taken by unworthy substitutes. According to such accounts, the people in former years were of a finer type, and I love this, this very comprehensive okay. list, they were of a finer type physically, mentally, and morally than their successors. All such comparisons between preceding generations and the present one should be carefully noted down with reference to the following points. Physical qualities, strength, endurance, ability to work and bear hardship, mental characteristics, intelligence, shrewdness, ability to learn, moral attributes, courage, truthfulness, honesty, kindness, charity fortitude, sobriety, amenity to discipline, etc. Aesthetic qualities, ability to sing, dance, tell stories, play music and games, or appreciate the beauty of nature. Specific details and instances should be inquired for and recorded. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that's fantastic. It's just so beautiful, that little description. But it goes to... Uh, well, it brought it home to me when I was over in Inch Man, and I met, I met the gentleman, um, one of these men who had walked over the fields to me, and I was like, I was trying to pick that stone up. I could get it to my knees, but I couldn't get it up under the wall. And I was like, I'm going to have to go home and eat a few more steaks, I said, before I try this again. And he was like, the men who lifted that never had a steak in their life, he said. Yeah. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? All they, all they ever done was eat fish that they caught from the sea or spuds that they picked from the ground, he said. And that's all they did. Yeah. But I mean, these men worked all day. They every worked day. all day. They worked you know? all day. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, like, what do you do? You go to the gym maybe for an hour, three, four times a week, two exactly. hours. Yeah. These guys worked all day long. Yeah. Every day. Rowing, yeah. picking. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything to do with it, fishing. Yep, yeah, 100%. Um, I want to give a, an account here. This is from... So w one of the things, I suppose, um, a and child, like in the future, that you'll, you'll have to look at or and we'll have to kind of work out how to go through it in more detail, is the main collection material, which isn't online to the same extent. But there's a whole other okay. manuscript collection of material here that will be oh useful. God. Okay, just... And this is one from Mayo that I translated recently just for, for the podcast here. And this gives a description. There are, you have There are a few accounts of competitions between two men to settle a dispute the idea of settling a dispute with reference to lifting the stone Brilliant. and this is a nice one but it has it has a there's just a bit of a narrative attached so i'll read through it this is a story called henry moore or kahan so henry moore meaning big henry big henry there was a man in eris they called henry moore and there was a man going around the towns who they called martin rua and every man had to give him i.e martin rua a bushel of barley in the autumn if they didn't martin rua would take it by force with a fight 
He had walked all over Eris and other men with him collecting the barley when he came as far as Henry Moore. Henry was out cutting barley when, Mar when Martin came as far as him. He told Henry the reason for his travels. And then Henry says to him, You'll not get any barley from me, said Henry, <laughs> until you fight me for it. Do you know, says Martin to Henry, what the name of this stick of timber of mine is? No, said Henry. A bushel of barley or a churl's head, said Martin. That's a nice little name, said Henry, but wait until you see the name of my bean, so, <laughs> he said, heading off to the place where he started work that morning and bringing back the stick. Do you know, said Henry, the name of this stick? I don't, said Martin. Take what you get or go to the devil, said Henry. When Martin Rua saw the weight of Henry Moore's staff, he grew frightened of him. Is there any exercise, says he to Henry, by which we can test ourselves without fighting? There is, says Henry. There's a little block of wood on the shore down here, and when the youth gather together on Sunday afternoon, again, again, go, yep. they go down to see who among them is the strongest, and the man who can pull the block to his knees, they say he's a good man, but the man who can shoulder the block, they call Far A Gailey. Far A Gailey kind of is like, Far is a man, but A Gailey <clears throat> is like, kind of, it's almost like something like an irrational animal or a madman almost, right? So like, you know, like a bizarre absolute beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So far, a gaily. They went down to the shore and Martin Rua thought he could lift the block, but he couldn't go near it. He couldn't pull it at all. Mm. Henry had to go next and on the first sweep he pulled it to his knees and on the second sweep he pulled it to his shoulder and on the third sweep he threw it over his head. Says Martin Rua to himself, I'm lucky I didn't start a fight with this man. <laughs> Martin Rua set off and from that day on he didn't collect another sheaf of barley in Ireland. That's, what a story. It's savage, isn't it? That's absolutely brilliant. It's like something from the wild west. It really is. It really is. And, you know, there's, there, there are a couple examples uh, in, in competitions where... They were sitting in a fight or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, when you see it, So one thing that comes through as well, and I suppose it's in the context maybe of when this was occurring around in say the late 19th century around the time maybe of the land war even agitation with England and independence often what you find in some of these narratives at least is that there's a competition settled between a local and an Englishman and that's something that you find also in um, kind of say feats of intelligence or versif versifying or mm. these kind of things where say um, an individual who, who ostensibly is taken to represent Ireland really yes. uh, has, a comp has a competition and, and bests the, 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 the English man who, who's okay. used, he's used in this narrative to represent other kind of say traditional perspectives or, or, or stresses in a, a traditional perspective or, or kind of a certain viewpoint right that yeah. oh this, this individual who kind of represents Ireland then actually uh, beats the, the, the farm exactly exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, so there's a piece that I want to, to read out that, that relates to that. This is a feat of strength against an Englishman in Kilcara and Dua in County Kerry. So yes. They have the same ones. <laughs> have it. Okay, they're on the same page, literally. Yeah. So Dua is a small village in North Kerry, east of Listowel. It's near the Limerick border. Do you want to read this one then? If you oh, no, you read it out. Okay, read it out, okay. please. Yeah, yeah. So it says here, At one time there were English visitors at Fitzmaurice's in Kilcara, Dua. These Fitzmaurice's were a Protestant family who owned a big tract of land around Dua. Among the visitors was one brave, strong fellow who did great feats in England and had a great opinion of himself. One day, as the visitors were walking in the lawn where there was a great big stone, which Shane Burns used to lift, the famous Englishman had a, had a great look at the stone and Mr. Fitzmaurice said, You seem to think you could lift that. I don't presume any such thing, replied the Englishman, or there isn't a man in Ireland to lift it. I bet you ten pounds I get a man sixty years of age to lift it. It's done, said the Englishman. Mr. Fitz sent for Sean, this is a guy, Sean Burns, who was mentioned earlier, and gave him a few pints of whiskey. There's your pre-workout. Just a couple of pints of whiskey, yeah. that's all. <laughs> uh, and he told Sean what he, what he wanted him for. Oh, said Sean, I'm too old for these things. That's like, you know, I'm not that man yeah. anymore in the movies. This is a scene. I'm too old for these things now. So the Englishman Clint said, Eastwood. there was never a day you could lift it. This rose Sean, and he made one drive at it and raised it to his knees. The Englishman put his hand in his pocket to give Sean the money, when Sean said, "'Tis lifted now, and I would defy any English Seanine to do it." At the remark, the Englishman drew his hand from his pocket and gave Sean nothing. But Fitzmaurice was very proud of the act. A Seanine is a kind of derogatory term for someone who prefers like English attitudes and customs, mm. or uh, has disdain for Irish customs, like a Jackie, you know. Yes, yep. Yeah. But again, it's something that you see where the tradition of stone lifting the tradition of stone lifting is kind of used to 
uh, reflect other stresses or tensions in the community between different groups, right? and, and and you see that kind of appearing in that in that particular context. So. I, I think I've um, I found that that house where that is as well. Really? Um, yeah, I was, and I contacted the, the Fitzmaurice estate. So many wait, and I, I called back from them to see if that stone is still there because I said it was on the lawn in, in the estate. Yeah, and I, I found the estate. Did you? Yeah, and, yeah. And um, like I said, I have contacted them, so I'm only waiting them to get back to me. Right. If it's there, wouldn't that be a fantastic story? Yeah, to have as well, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, amazing, and like, and there, and there's lifting a social in a sort of political context. Exactly, you know? in a kind of political context, as and you see that again and again. There's this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of competitive aspect to it, where somebody is represent is, uh, kind of representing Ireland through through this yeah. this narrative again, where, and that's something you see in, in folk tradition all the time. So yeah, another another kind of aspect of this to cover, <clears throat> something I found interesting. The vast majority of these lifts are by men. It's it's largely a male dominated tradition, but there are a couple of accounts that mention female stone lifters. There's one, you've probably seen this from the school's collection, um, and, off, and what, what's often described is that the, the, the woman comes and she and she bests all the men in the area. Yes, she's way better is, than all, all of the men yep. in the area. This account here says, um, beside the old church in Clonagill, there's a stone about 400 weight. It is said that the men of the locality used to have trials of strength as to who could lift the stone highest from the ground. One Sunday evening, while the competition was going on, a woman whose name is said to be Mrs. Kildee came on the scene. She remained looking at them for some, t- for some time, and then she began to jeer at them for being so weak. <laughs> she finally took part in the competition herself, and having beaten the men as to height, she heaved the stone clean over a six-foot wall. The stone is still pointed out. It now lies where it fell, as the men despaired of ever being equal to emulating the feet of this Amazon. There is hardly a man at present who can lift this stone even one inch off the ground. I want to find this stone. Modern uh, story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Clonagill, that's Offaly, isn't it? Isn't that in Offaly? I'm not sure. Clonagill? I'm not sure. I'll have to look into that a bit more. Another one here, Unclucher Ochin from Hedford and Galway. Forgive me if I'm humming and hawing or something to translate this from uh, on the fly as I go. So, before there, so there was a man called Tomaso Hishin, Tomas Nagluch. So there was a man called Tomaso Oshin, who was uh, Tomas of the Stone, oh. who, who was called, who was living in Bun and Tubber. Um, it was just a place in Galway and, and the ruins of his house are still there he was a stonemason and he was a very strong man he had a sister who was stronger than him she was called Moira Moor in the Gluch Big Mary of the Stones <laughs> what a name so, so Tomas Tama, was riding to Galway one day on a horse uh, beside the old road uh, he was going with Big Mary behind him on the riding uh, pinion, I guess, yeah. behind him on the horse. Um, as they were tra- traversing over this bridge, this is when the following event happened. Four men were trying to put a huge stone up onto the uh, the end of the bridge. Mm. They couldn't do it. Gawanish and Moira said so go on now, Mary, and put that stone up for them. Mary got down from the horse. Uh, she had a, a cloak on and she and a Oh, she skirt the sheer fin as so she kind of gathered up her skirt. Crumb she could do, so she bent down to pick up the stone and picked it up. With the amount of weight that was in the stone, her foot gave out from under her, it kind of slipped. Uh, and she fell and, and let out a huge shout. That shout was heard in Bun and Tubber. The name is written on that stone in that bridge, Mora Ni Ushin. Her name is engraved into it apparently. So it's just a few references to, to, to female, female stone lifters, which form well. part of the tradition as well. But it must be said, as this kind of, they, they don't feature in this to the same frequency, say, but an interesting part. Very much so. Um, there's a piece of audio that I want to play, which I think you'll like. This was recorded in 1982. Okay. And it was recorded from one Pat Cadigan uh, and Mary Cadigan. And, and they were living in, in Hollyoke in Massachusetts. So in 1982, Seamus O'Cahan, Professor Seamus O'Cahan, who's a former director of the, of the Department of Folklore here, and Leo Cordoff, who was a sound technician, um, they went over, they travelled over to, to Massachusetts and they specifically wanted to interview people who'd left Ireland, a lot of people who'd left Mayo and some of the guys at and Kerry as well, and who would never come back, right? So you hear yeah. a lot of stories about the kind of people who made a success of themselves. What happened to the people who went over there and they never bloody returned? Mm-hmm. So there are fantastic interviews covering all aspects of, of life and custom and what happened to these people and, and you know, they've now, they, they had settled out and had families and, I mean, their relatives are, are over there now, right? In this account, Pat is talking about um, a strong man who, in, in, who had come to Boston 
in the 19, late 19th century, I think, and they called him Pat the Anchor. And what they called him Yeah, they called him Pat the Anchor <laughs> because there was, there was a bay in, in Boston called Back Bay. And in the 19th century, I think it was like the largest landfill operation of its day, where it was this kind of tidal floodplain, and it was the land was filled in, it was reclaimed, and now there's like a neighbourhood on top of it, houses, people right. live there. But it was a huge landfill operation, and so Pat the Anchor appears one day, uh, he's just called Pat at this stage, and he's asked for a job, and he's told, yeah, get your pick, you know, get your shovel, go to work. He didn't have a pick, and he's described here that he, there was a, an anchor from a little boat, which he picks up and uses as his, as his pick for the day, until the four-man season, was like, what the hell are you doing? He became known as Pat the Anchor. And then Pat Cadigan, who's telling us the story, goes on to describe... Um, some of the, the, the kind of contests of strength he saw in Mayo in his youth. So okay, how's here? All right, to talk now. Yeah. yeah. You know, when they were building the, down in Boston, they were building the, the bay there, the Black Bay, they, they came up and hunt all over for men. That's 50 years before me. And there was a man there, he come from Mayo, man, from Charaman. Did you ever heard about Charaman, yeah. yeah. Machen was his name. Pat Machen. And the guy says, you get your shovels and picks. And the poor man, he, he looked around, he couldn't get no shovel, no pick. There was nothing there. But there was a little boat dry high up on the sand, and was the anchor was there, you know, just like a, a pick. So he went and he took the anchor. And took they call him Pat the Anchor. <laughs> <laughs> so the timekeeper coming around in the afternoon, he says, hi, Pat, how, what, how, where did you get that? Well, he says, all right, I got it all day. <laughs> so that was a strong man. He well, he was the strongest man that came over there. His name was Pat Machen. Machen, okay. still he's, well, he's dead a long time ago. Well, he was a mighty strong man. Oh, yeah, yes, he was. And that, he, he, was a good looking, he was a good looking man. Mm. Did they have any competitions of carrying weights or throwing weights? or? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's was going on lately, but even when I was going around, but not no more. The country borns ain't interested in that. But you saw, you saw those? I did, I did. It was a, but a man be asked like to lift 200 weight or something oh, yes, like that? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. 200 weight, well, I could do that myself. Oh, well, 200 weight, not. 300 weight. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Sure, isn't that fantastic? It's a lovely little piece, and and it's it it's straight after that. Um, the other collectors there with him, Seamus. There's a kind of moment, and I feel like Pat has way more to say yeah. about that. And then Seamus is maybe not familiar with the top or not particularly thinking about, it, or he has another thing he wants to cover, and he he comes in with the next question. And were there many traditional tunes or singers or something to do with music? And so it's just it's just yeah, it's gone. Cut it, it off really before, good. yeah, yeah. But um, but still, a beautiful account. What a you know? story! A beautiful account. What yeah. a nickname! <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it does so, exactly uh, what it says in the team, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I want to start to draw this to a close. It's been oh, such a pleasure chatting to you. I'm so excited, so excited that you finally can get get to meet in person and you get to come in and see the collections here. It speaks, I think, to the testament of like a tribute to, first of all, to the men and women who were so generous with their knowledge and information back through the 20th century in the 30s, 40s, 50s and on, who shared this stuff. And then with the commission who collected it, that now we have this sort of tabernacle, this kind of lifeboat where, where we, can, we can access these records and then find where within a couple of generations all this, all this information is now... It's lying in kind of silently in fields and ditches overgrown around the country, but people don't know. And if they did know, we can take great pride in this and, and, and to reanimate it suddenly. So I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's really inspiring. And you also mentioned, um, forgive me, I forget his name, a friend of yours who's in Canada, an Irish man. Warren McGeegan. Warren McGeegan. And then you mentioned another man, Davy well, Jones. You're Davy Jones, who's an, a strong man who's come with me. And Stevie Shanks, there's a massive mention as well up in uh, Northern Ireland. And it's, it, it, it goes to, to, to show as well, like tradition itself, that this is a communal thing. It doesn't belong to any one person no. or any group. It's, it's, it, it belongs to all of us. And if and anybody has any information, you know, I mean, please send it on to so me. So where, where can people where can people find you online? Yeah, they can the find place? me by my name, David Keown, just on Facebook. That's K-E-O-H-A-N. And um, you'll find me under Irish Move Athlete on Instagram. Um, or my my um my Gmail is keown.david, so it's K-E-O-H-A-N dot David at gmail.com. And if anybody has any information, please don't hesitate to send it to me because this is just a massive passion of mine. I mean, and what I love about these stones is, like I said, they're not just stones. 
they're, they're touchstones to our like political history, to our like our socioeconomic history, our mythology. Um, you know, they're mass stones, they're everything. They're, they're, they're our culture, they're our heritage, and they're who we are as a people, and we should never forget that. You know, so I mean, if anybody has any more information, please send it on. And um, I'm really enjoying the journey. And I just want to say one more time, thank you so much, Johnny, for having me up oh, here. It's been an absolute pleasure. And pleasure I've seen the, uh, the, the caliber of people you've had on this podcast. I was pretty nervous coming in, but I've really, really enjoyed it. Oh, it's so a thank total you. pleasure. No, it's a total pleasure for me. Um, I want to finish this, just one little piece, which you probably read. I just thought it was funny. It made me think of you from Longford. It's the heading here. Man from County Longford travels the country looking for stones to lift. There was a man who would go any distance if he heard of any weight or stone that no other man could carry or lift. He often went five or six miles to lift one. Four, five or six. I don't know his name, but he lives in Ahakiran. It's amazing that he was, you know, traveling the whole country then as five or six miles, whereas you're literally traversing the entire country up and down to, to kind of reinvigorate and reanimate what could be a really vibrant tradition and way to connect with our past, our forebears. Um, and uh, so, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thanks a million again, man. Delighted. Pleasure. 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 Pleasure.